Good morning, family, and welcome to the first Sunday of Advent. The season of Advent is the start of the Christian year, and it's more than a way to count down the days until Christmas. You see, the church views life and the world differently. We have different values and priorities than the culture around us. Therefore, we mark time differently. It would make sense if we started our year with Christmas, but we don't. We don't start on January 1st or even at Easter. The Christian calendar begins with Advent, a season of preparation and waiting and expectation. So why Advent? Why not jump right into Christmas like everyone else? That would certainly be a lot more fun, wouldn't it? So Advent puts Christmas into its proper place for us. And what is Christmas? Christmas is nothing less than the completely disruptive breaking in of the God who makes all things new. Now hold on to that image of disruptive breaking in. Advent helps us understand how the birth of Jesus that we celebrate every Christmas is so very good. And we do that by observing four weeks of expectant waiting to remind ourselves that there are times in life when God seems silent and distant. But he always shows up. God always keeps his word and comes to us. God is not silent. God is not still. God is not absent. And more often than not, he comes to us in unexpected times and to unexpected places, like in the middle of an oppressive empire and to a little town called Bethlehem. Advent is our annual reminder that God is not passively good. God is actively good. Even when we can't see or hear or feel him, God is actively good. This year, we'll walk through Advent with our old friend, the prophet Isaiah. He will help as we wait for the arrival of our king. So let's begin with the 64th chapter of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord. Rip the heavens apart. Come down, Lord, make the mountains tremble. Be a spark that starts a fire, causing water to boil. Then your enemies will know who you are. All nations will tremble because you are nearby. Your fearsome deeds have completely amazed us. Even the mountains shake when you come down. You are the only God ever seen or heard of who works miracles for his followers. You help all who gladly obey and do what you want, but sin makes you angry. Only by your help can we ever be saved. We are unfit to worship you. Each of our good deeds is merely a filthy rag. We dry up like leaves. Our sins are storm winds sweeping us away. No one worships in your name or remains faithful. You have turned your back on us and let our sins melt us away. You, Lord, are our Father. We are nothing but clay, but you are the potter who molded us. Don't be so furious or keep our sins in your thoughts forever. Remember that all of us are your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years ago, when my kids were little, we were playing hide and seek in the house one day when one of them, and I won't tell you which one, stood in the middle of the living room with their hands over their eyes, thinking that if they could not see me, then I could not see them. Seeing and being seen are not the same thing. This morning, we see that the prophet Isaiah was terribly frustrated. He could not see God, and he felt like God could not see him. Isaiah believed that God was hiding in anger. He could not sense God, so he cried, God, I wish you would rip the heavens apart and come down. Have you ever felt that way? Come to think of it, isn't that a fitting request for the year 2020? Rip the heavens apart and come down, God. Have you ever wanted God to burst onto the scene in unmistakable, unmatched power? Rip the heavens apart and come down. Save us. Fix this mess. 
God, we need you to show up with such force that even the mountains will shake at your appearing. This was the desperate cry of the poet prophet Isaiah. He had warned his countrymen about their disobedience. You see, the evil Assyrians had wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel. They obliterated everyone and everything. So Isaiah warned his countrymen in the south that the destruction of their cousins to the north would happen to them too if they did not repent and follow God. But of course, very few people paid attention. Now, the Babylonians were at their doorstep, threatening to destroy God's people. Understandably, Isaiah felt trapped. Can you relate? It's hard to sustain your faith and your hope when you feel trapped, isn't it? It's hard to sustain your faith and hope when it feels like God has moved far away. Well, that's how Isaiah felt. So, trapped between unbelieving countrymen and bloodthirsty Babylonians, Isaiah begged God to rip the heavens apart and calm down. Isaiah wanted God to prove himself. He knew enough about God to know that God loves to show up in unexpected places and at unexpected times. Come down and show everyone who's boss. Come down and fix this mess. Have you ever prayed like that? A lot of God's adopted daughters and sons pray this kind of prayer, don't they? Don't we? It's the kind of prayer that we pray when we read about violence against a particular group of people. God, come down and fix this. It's the kind of prayer that bursts from the hearts of God's people when we hear about political corruption and foolishness. It's the kind of prayer we whisper when we read about deadly famines, storms, or earthquakes. It's the kind of prayer that arises when we hear about sexual misconduct or abuse of power inside and outside the church, isn't it? Rip the heavens apart and calm down. Have you felt that way this year? God, why don't you show those troublemakers Show our enemies who's boss. But as soon as this prayer leaves Isaiah's lips, he has a realization. He realizes that God's own people have become God's enemies. Isaiah is forced to admit, we who were once clean have become unclean. And he uses some very picturesque speech. Our good deeds are like filthy rags. We are all shriveled up like leaves. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. How unclean have they become? Disgustingly, revoltingly unclean. Not to be too graphic, but the Hebrew language Isaiah used, the phrase filthy rag literally translates into a woman's menstrual cloth. We are tainted, fouled, and stained, and we are shriveled up like raspy, dry, dead leaves that the wind blows away. The people of God who were once clean and holy and vibrant have become offensively filthy. We have met God's enemy, and it is us. I have seen God's enemy, and it is me. So almost as quickly as Isaiah begs God to come down and crush his enemies, Isaiah realizes that God's own people have become God's enemies. No one in Israel calls on your name. No one in the church is faithful. You have turned your back on us and let our sins melt us away. We're sorry to say, God, that our hands are dirty and the best we have to offer you is soiled and smudged. And to be honest, we don't give you very much very often. So now we're going to get what we deserve. You see, it's not just God's enemies who are in the wrong. It's not just the nations not just those evil, wicked, ungodly outsiders, but it's the insiders. It's God's people who are in desperate need of transformation. It's not just the mountains that need a good shaking. It's us. Today, as the church prepares to celebrate God's ripping open of the heavens to come down to us in the form of a babe in Bethlehem, 
Isaiah gives us an appropriate Advent prayer and posture. You see, it's not just abusers, terrorists, politicians, and polluters who have sinned against God. It's the very people who can hardly wait to celebrate God's Christmas arrival. God didn't need to tear open the heavens to come to earth just to fix others or to make right all that is wrong. God needed to come down in the form of a baby to save those of us who so gladly sing Christmas carols and tell and retell the Christmas story. Advent is a good time to remember that the only reason Jesus ever came into our time and space in the first place was because of his love for us even when we don't love him. He came to us because we are weak and oh so easily tempted. But Isaiah experiences another shift. Just when it feels like all is lost, Isaiah finds hope. You, Lord, are our Father. We are nothing but clay, but you are the potter who molded us. Don't be so furious or keep our sins in your thoughts forever. Remember that all of us are your people. Isn't that a great Advent prayer? God, you are still our Father. We are still your children. We're just lumps of clay who are nothing unless you sculpt and mold us. So please do that, we pray. Make us look like you again. Come to us and be gentle with us so that we may follow you again. As Advent people, we prepare to celebrate that God, in Jesus, has already split open the heavens and come down to us. That's the Christmas story. But here's the very best part. God came down to us in love and mercy. God came down to embrace us. God did not come down to dispose of us like filthy rags or to sweep us away like dried leaves. God, in Jesus, came to love us. Even though we come to this season to look back to God's splitting of the heavens 2,000 years ago when he sent Jesus to us, Advent is the time to recognize the ways God constantly comes to us. God always comes to us through his Holy Spirit. He constantly makes himself present to, with, and among us. And he's not exclusive to us. He makes himself present to, with, and among us all of his creation. God is always present with us, and he shows up in the most unexpected places and at the most unexpected times. He's present even when it feels like he's far away. He speaks even when he feels silent. He's present even in the times and places that feel to us God-forsaken. He's present even when we stand in the middle of life with our hands over our eyes, thinking that he can't see us. So we observe Advent because Advent rekindles our hope. It challenges our cynicism. It calls us to believe in fresh possibilities. And we need that this year, don't we? Advent calls us to believe in new beginnings. It opens us up to new encounters with God, which is important. Because when we look at the world around us, when we take stock of ourselves, our default setting is to become depressed. We're tempted to resign ourselves to the way things are, and then it becomes impossible to imagine a way out of the mess that we're in. Looking back at the long list of hardships in 2020, it's hard to believe that anything will change, that anything can fix this sad, sad world. But that's not how Advent people think. Our God has a good memory. He never forgets his people, and he never forgets his promises. We believe in a God who shows up, who promised to be with us and to meet our needs, and both Advent and Christmas remind us that he does precisely that. We believe in a God who does deeds that completely amaze us don't we? We believe in a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. He is always with us. God never forgets his people or his promises. And he comes to us to love us and to save us 
and to fill us with hope, even in a year like 2020. Let's pray. Creator of the world, you are the potter, we are the clay, and you form us in your image. Shape our spirits by Christ's transforming power, that as one people we may live out your compassion and justice, whole and sound in the realm of your peace. Give us ears to hear, O God, and eyes to watch, that we may know your presence in our midst during this holy season of joy as we anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ. And now, using the words debts and debtors, let us pray with boldness the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me. Your job this week is to love at least three people and make sure at least one of them doesn't deserve it, okay? Because everybody needs to know that God loves them no matter what, right? Don't let the cares, concerns, and craziness of these days rob you of your joy. With Jesus, we always, always, always have hope. Now receive these words of benediction today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.